church that meets here at Malden, and to our visitors, we want you to know you're our honored guest. We hope you'll stick around after the <laughs> services so we can get to meet you, and there are, there should be a, a card in the table on the front of you. If you don't mind filling that, drop in a question or give it to one of the members so we can have a record of your attendance, please. I hope each one of you picked up a bulletin. I'm not going to wear all things in the bulletin. Let's remember all the shut-ins that's in the bulletin. Let's remember our sick. Let's remember Deborah Clark. She's home recovering. Also, let's remember Charles Moses. He's in rehab at this time. So let's remember him as he's struggling right now. Also, let's remember Sue Deal. She had went to the hospital on Friday. She's home now. So let's keep her in our prayers. And also Marge Jones. She has pneumonia. So let's remember her. Uh, also, uh, Michael Brown told me that his son, Michael Brown, he's in Guam. Uh, he just has left to go there, so let's keep him as he's there you know, in our prayers also. Also, last night we had a great time. It was a soup and game time. Hope each one of you had a good time that was here, and if you missed it, hope you'll be able to come to the next one we have. You see anybody with spoons sticking out their hands or anything? I mean, I could see why, the way they were fighting over them spoons. So, uh, also, the evening of prayer will be Monday evening at 7 o'clock, so it'll be tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And also, ladies' Bible class will be next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. So, ladies, remember that. Uh, into our services today, our song leader will be Joel Foster, our scripture reading Ray Moore, our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closing prayer by Joe Mormon. If you will, bow with me as we begin our open worship service with our open prayer. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for our health and our strength that allows us to come out and be here with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for your son, Jesus, as he was willing to come to this earth. He set an example for each and every one of us. 
He hung up on that cruel cross and died there for each and every one of us if we do thy will. That we can, his will that at the end of our time we can have a home with him in heaven. Thank you for the rain that we're having. Thank you for the sunshine and the different seasons that we have that we can see the beauties of thy earth. Thank you for each and everything that you do for us, things we've asked you in prayer, that the way you've answered them, we know it's the best for us. Also, I pray at this time that you'll be with all of our members <coughs> that are shutting us, be with all of our sick, be with the ones I mentioned this morning, that they may recover, be with the doctors and nurses and the ones that's taking care of them. They may be back with us as their earliest opportunities. Also, I pray at this time you'll be the ones that are on foreign souls. Pray that you'll keep them safe and also return them back to their families. Be with our visitors that are here with us this morning. Pray if they're traveling that you'll keep them safe and return them back to their homes. Also, I pray at this time you be with our brother Joel as he leads our singing today. We will all lift up our voices and <coughs> praise unto you. Be with brother Dennis as he have, does the lesson this morning. That he have read recollection of things that he studied. And pray each one of us will take these things that he teaches unto us. We'll study them our own selves. So we can be stronger Christians. We can teach others and be shining examples in our community. Thank you for getting us and you say you've worked here with us at this congregation. Pray that you'll always be with us here at Malden, that each and everything we say and do will always be according to our will. Pray at this time you'll be with our leaders of our nation. Pray they'll look unto you for guidance. Pray that you'll defeat them in things that's not according to thy will. Also, pray that you'll be with all of our military. Be with our first responders or policemen. Pray that you'll keep them safe and always return them back to their families at the end of their duties. Pray that you'll always be with us, that you'll always guard, guide, direct us, and forgive us for all our many sins. Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Morning. 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 Strong rain yesterday and last night. It's good to see everyone that made it out this morning. Eight seven nine. Eight seven nine. Morning has broken. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing, praise for the morning, praise for them springing, fresh from the word. Sweet the rain's new. Right. 
every morning, God's recreation of the new day. Prayer minds for taking the Lord's Supper. Two nine nine. <clears throat> Two nine. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will. had no tears for his own grace, but sweat drops as blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful, is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died chapter 22 tells us then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. Down in verse 14 it says and the hour came he reclined at the table and his disciples with him and he said I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. What a great time to have those closest to him to come together. During a time that was probably one of the greatest moments in Jewish history. The Passover lamb in Egypt that was sacrificed, that was consumed that kept the death angel away. The blood from that lamb that was spread on to the lentils of the door. Now Jesus was going to give them a better sacrifice, a more perfect lamb. And he gave us this feast to remember that sacrifice by. <coughs> It says that he took the cup. And then he had given thanks. He 
said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, given for each of us, each of us. We would not be here without it. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise with the cup, after they had eaten, he said, This is the cup poured out for you. It is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant. The blood of Christ that was shed on that cross that had our sins forgiven. The same blood, as 1 John tells us, continually washes us when we repent. The blood doesn't go away. It stays. And for that we are grateful. And it, it is because of that that we need to put everything aside. Every care. Every thought. And focus on that cross. Let us have now the offering for the bread. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we gather around that table on this first day of the week, as your word commands, remember the great sacrifice given to us by Jesus. Let us focus our minds on Jesus as he, as he gave his life for us. And as we partake of this bread that represents Jesus' body, pray that we would do so in remembrance of him and that we do so in in, in pleasing in your sight. And it is in Christ's loving name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's have now a prayer for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us now as we partake of this cup, which represents Christ's blood that was shed on the cross. May we as Christians partake of it in a manner well pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
concludes the Lord's Supper, we are also commanded on the first day to lay by in store so that there be no collections to come when the need arises. You know, as we look around in the religious world today and they have rummage sales and car washes and bake sales to raise money for the church. They depend oftentimes on people outside of the church to fund whatever is necessary. But the Lord had something different in mind. The Lord puts the demand on us to take care of the needs of the congregation, to be able to further his word in this world, in our communities. He does this by allowing us to determine within our own hearts what sacrifice we're going to use and give. It is to come from a cheerful heart. It is to come from a heart that desires so much for the work of the Lord's Church to continue, not only in our communities but around the world to be able to take care of one another and others. And we have been very blessed. Everything that we have is not ours. We are just the caretakers of it. So we need to be mindful of that and allow our giving, however much it is, to come totally from the heart. Not so that we can receive the praise of men, so that we can please our Father in heaven. Let us now have a prayer for the offering. Dear Lord, we just, we're so thankful for all that we do have in this life. We're thankful for our homes, our families, and our means of income. We, just, we know that none of this is possible without Thee. We pray that we keep these thoughts in mind as we prepare to give. We pray that our given will be found acceptable to Thee. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Three, 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 three. <laughs> Am I a soldier of the cross, the follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause, or blush to speak his name? Must I
be reading Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up, he went up on, on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Last week we started off in the airport. This morning I'd like us to go back to that airport where we were. You remember there were some folks that were relaxed and comfortable because they had confirmed tickets. They know where they're going. They know what their destination is. And then there are others who are standing close to the ticket counter. They're pacing around. They're worried. They're anxious. They're uncertain about whether or not they will reach their destination because they are flying standby. The difference, as we said last week, was caused by the confidence factor. If we knew in 15 minutes that we would have to stand in judgment before God and learn of our eternal destiny, what would our reaction be? Are we sure of our salvation or not? Last week, we said as children of God, we can be sure and we can have the confidence of our salvation. And there are three scriptures that we should keep in the forethought every time we start to question our salvational assurance. The first one is in 1 John chapter 5 and verses 11 through 14. For John says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And he who has the Son and has life, he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence we have toward him. And if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear us. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, where Paul writes, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. And finally, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, where Peter writes here, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. And for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with knowledge. And knowledge was self-control, and self-control was steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is nearsighted, that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed of his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this you, for in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we look at these, when we start to doubt our salvation, 
these scriptures remind us that a self-examination is necessary. Necessary in order for us to determine our relationship with God. We need to know for certain whether or not we are living out these Christian virtues. In fact, our salvational assurance is based more on attitudes than it is behavior. For we can do all the right things out of the wrong attitude and still not be justified in God's eye. And the reason for this is that behavior follows attitude. If we have the right mind, the right heart, the right attitude, if we have the right disposition, then we will have the right behavior, and it will be all packed. For David said that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And Jesus also said that out of the heart, a man speaks and behaves. So our attitudes are of the most importance. How we think, how we behave. So this morning, our lesson, we will go to the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus begins teaching attitudes, the attitudes that we are to have. There are Three things vital for our salvation. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2. It says, Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain and he sat down, and his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed. Go back to the airport. <clears throat> Two groups of people standing around Jesus as he talked. The blessed and not the blessed. The blessed are the ones who are enjoying the assurance of their salvation because they're saved. And then those who are not blessed. Those who are unhappy because they are not certain of their destination. The word blessed in the original language literally means happy. And it is based, used to describe, a peace that we have within ourselves. And Jesus here is describing a divinely bestowed blessing and well-being that can only belong to the faithful. Those who are confident in their relationship with God. The happiness that Jesus speaks does not come from any external source, but it comes from within, inside our hearts, regardless of those external circumstances and situations. It is an attitude that allows happiness even in tough times and even when it seems as if life is crushing the life out of us. The first attitude that Jesus speaks about is humility. In verse 3 of Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are happy because they have the kingdom of heaven. But who are that poor in spirit? Just who is Jesus bestowing this blessing on? Friends, it is those who understand their condition before God. Those who see themselves as sinners who do not have any resources to save themselves. And Jesus is saying this in direct opposition of the prideful rich and the self-sufficiency. It speaks of those who realize their total helplessness and their lost state apart from the love, mercy, and grace that can only come from God. 
when we think we're okay because we're a good person, because we work hard, because we rarely miss services, we don't murder, we don't lie, we don't steal, we don't drink, we don't cheat. So we all think that we're pretty good people. Friends, self-righteousness will get nobody to heaven. We might think that we're better than some others in church. But that goodness will not bring heaven into our grasp without that obedient faith in Christ. Friends, apart from God, we're totally lost. It is by his grace and the sending of his son and our faith in him that saves us. And Jesus gives us two parables that help us understand exactly what it means to be poor in spirit. The first one we find in Luke chapter 15 is the parable of the prodigal son. This wayward son had found himself completely undone. He was helpless. He was hopeless. He was condemned to live a pig pen existence in a far country. But he came to realize that that world and those resources meant nothing. And that his relationship with the Father meant everything. And so we hear him saying in verse 18 and 19, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. David spoke about this heart condition in Psalm 51, in verse 17, that God desires a contrite and broken heart. Speaking of those who are poor in spirit. The second illustration comes from Luke chapter 18 in verses 10 through 14. The tax collector and the publican, or the Pharisee. The tax collector was praying, beating on his chest, praying to God that he would be merciful to him because he was a sinner. All the while, the Pharisee standing there, too proud to admit his sins and bragging about his own righteousness. And Jesus concluded that parable when he said, Who do you think went home that day justified before God? He that humbles himself shall be exalted. We cannot enjoy the confidence of our salvation until we see ourselves as we really are, one in need. God's forgiveness. In the Scottish Highlands, <clears throat> sheep that are herded up there would often wander off among the rocks. And sometimes they would get themselves into places that they couldn't get out of. Now the grass in these areas are very sweet and the sheep cannot get enough of it. They like it so much that oftentimes they will jump down 10 to 12 feet down into a place in order to get the grass that's in there. But the only problem is, is that sheep are so dumb, they don't realize at the time that once they're down, they can't get back up. And so when they realize they're stuck, they start bleeding. And they start bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. And the shepherd, he hears them. But he lets him go on bleeding. You see, because that sheep, he's going to end up eating whatever grass is down there. And when he's done, the shepherd's going to know when he's done, but the shepherd's not going to go down just yet. He's going to let him on down there for a little while longer until that sheep gets hungry and tired and weak. Then the shepherd climb down the rope, pick up the sheep, and bring them back up. But why does he wait? 
As parents, you know, when our children cry, we're there faster than we realize. But you see, that shepherd knows if he goes down into that ravine or whatever, that that sheep is going to run around like a puppy dog wanting to play. And chances are, it's going to run off that cliff and die or get hurt. So the shepherd waits until he is in such a condition that he's seeking the holy help there is. That is what it means to be poor in spirit. When there is nothing left that we can do. And we seek our shepherd. We are the sheep of God's pasture. And when we try to save ourselves. By trying to place God in our favor. By being a good person then we're only fooling ourselves. And this will never lead to eternal life. The second attitude is that of genuine repentance. This is verse 4 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is contrary to what the world tries to tell us. For we all thinks it should say, happy are those who rejoice and laugh. But God's ways we need to remember, as the scriptures tell us, are far higher than ours. As far as the heavens are from the earth. Blessed are those who mourn. The word as translated to mourn, means mourning that brings tears to the eyes. In the Septuagint, this word was used to describe Jacob's mourning for Joseph when he thought Joseph was dead. Jesus is speaking here of mourning over the sins that have been committed. He speaks of that godly sorrow that produces repentance that leads to to our salvation. Jesus is not talking about a worldly remorse that comes because we fear that we are going to be punished by God for our misconduct. This is the true sorrow that we have because we have disobeyed the one that paid the price for our misconduct by dying on that cross. And for us realizing that we have put him to open shame just as those who had crucified him. This kind of sorrow that Jesus is talking about here doesn't come from fear. It comes from love. Much like the only example I could give, earthly example, would be a spouse who has so really hurt the other spouse and they come before them with such remorse that they're crying because they're so sorry. Or when we punish our children and we may go a little overboard and we realize it and we stop and we've got tears in our eyes because we hurt them so much. That's the kind of remorse that is kind of sorrow that Jesus speaks of. Friends, we'll never, never genuinely repent unless we truly regret our sins because we have offended God, not because we got caught or because God is going to condemn us for our sins. Because we offended the one who created us and who died for us. We will never repent of sins that we are not mourning over or weeping over. In James chapter 4 and verses 8 through 10, James writes, Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves. 
before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You know, there have been times where I've been told that I've stepped on toes with some of the sermons. The question is, did God's word step on our toes enough for us to make the needed changes in our lives? Or did we just go home and soak our feet for a little while until the pain went away? There is nothing more comforting than knowing that we are forgiven and saved and heaven back. There is one other thing before we move to the third point. We need to distinguish between condemnation that comes from guilt and the conviction of sin by the Holy Spirit. Condemnation that comes from being caught is from Satan. And it makes us miserable. Conviction of sin from the Holy Spirit is from God. And it leads us to a godly sorrow that results in biblical repentance, which results in salvational happiness. And finally, we have the attitude of meekness. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Again, an opposite that human beings think of. For the earth belongs to the strong. They're the ones who can keep it. They're the ones who can fight for it and wrestle it away. But friends, that biblical meekness has nothing to do with a lack of strength or weakness or wimpiness. Jesus is speaking about a combination of ability and willingness to control ourselves regardless of the situation or circumstances. He is speaking about an empowerment that is provided by the Spirit of God. It is this empowerment that allows us to obey God even when the times get rough and even when it means our lives are at stake. That word, meek, used in the original language was oftentimes used to speak about a colt that was broken so that one could ride it. The one thing we need to remember is even after that colt is broken, his strength has not been removed or subdued. It just means that his strength has been redirected for his master's use. And Jesus had that biblical meekness in Matthew 11, verse 29, where he said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Our salvational rest and assurance comes from us being like Christ, poor in spirit and meek. And the greatest example of biblical meekness can be seen in the suffering and death on that cross. In Philippians 2 and verse 8, it says, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That, my friends, is power under control. For Jesus had the power to come down from that cross. He was God in the flesh. And he said in Matthew 26, verse 53, Do you not think that I cannot appeal to my Father and he will at once send 12 legions of angels? Finally remember that verse in Bible class. 
Jesus is the epitome of biblical meekness, of power under control. And when we become more like him in this attitude, we will be a lot more sure of our salvation. As we close, there's something that we need to understand. And if we have these attitudes in our lives, we will be a lot more confident of our salvation. Because these are the attitudes that testify of our assurance. This is God's spirit testifying with our spirit that we are saved and saved in the arms of Jesus. And this is a feeling of security that is based on the truth that if we obey him, we are saved. Now let's go back to the airport. Which of these two groups are we more like? Are we like those who are biblically confirmed to our destination? Or are we hopping around and nervously hoping against hope that we'll get a ticket? We need to decide for our own salvation. And if you are not a child of God, we want to give you the opportunity to decide this morning. That through repentance and confession, the New Testament baptism to have your sins washed away. You can become that child of God. You can have that ticket, confirmed ticket in your hand. <coughs> You're on your way. Dad? If you are a child of God already and you're contemplating, you just don't know for sure, or you need to get some things off your chest between you and God. Or maybe you just need our prayers. The opportunity to do so is now, as together we stand and we sing.
you to be with them always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have uh, Sunday evening, our evening of prayer at 7 o'clock. Uh, next Saturday, be mindful of ladies' Bible class at 10 o'clock. And uh, in two weeks will be our fellowship meeting. I almost said next week, but then I remembered we still got another Sunday to go. So I appreciate you all being here this morning. I really do. At this time, if you'll stand, we'll be dismissed with prayer. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we pray that you be with us as we leave this place this morning. We pray, we pray that we worship you in a way that is simple in your sight. We always want to show forth our love for Jesus and how much he means to our lives every day. Heavenly Father, we pray for your church, the world over, wherever it meets together. We pray, especially the church that meets here at Mola, that you be with us and help us to gain strength as Christians in our community and put forth the efforts that we need to spread your word in this community. Heavenly Father, we are thankful always for our families and our blessings. Thank you for our homes and the things that we have in them for our comforts of life. We always thank you for this nation, the freedom that we have in the United States of America. We pray for our leaders in this nation, that they'll lead this country in ways which will be more acceptable on your side. We pray for the world, Heavenly Father, world over, especially the ones in, in more torn areas this morning, that they would be safe from harm. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for our number who are sick, uh, many who are not able to be with us this morning. We pray for Sue Dill, as always. If she be covered and strengthened through your word, we pray for uh, Ruth and Deborah and, and Rick to be with them as they struggle with her, her illness. We pray for Teen Westmoreland to be with her and help her. She struggles with the illness also. We other do her in ill health. We pray for her and every father to be with them and help her get strong. We, are, we, are, we learned a lesson this morning about being against Heavenly Father. We pray that we be make them in the strongest Christians and be able to set forth the things that we've heard about in the lesson today. We, Heavenly Father, we, we, we will go forth from this place today and want to live as Christians, teaching others and helping others along the way. We pray be with us and help us every day uh, be stronger as Christians and do the things you have us to will. We pray for the loving name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.